Hey people, it is 4.11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, July 23rd, 2017, I guess. Now, before I start the continuance of the reading of They Were White and They Were Slaves by Michael Hoffman II, I would like to say, concerning anybody who might be listening, that is of the, for lack of a better term, Calvinistic bent because I, I would have described myself as essentially a Calvinist for a long time, actually. Um, I would also have said, I don't know how you can read and pay attention to what the scriptures say and not be. Um, I don't know how you can pay attention to the characteristics of the Almighty and how he declares the end from the beginning, and his elect, and when he chose them, and not be. But, I know there are plenty who still aren't. Maybe it's because they don't want to deal with uh, the harsh um, clarity of... What Calvinism, or you can call it the doctrines of grace, you can call it, you know, election, eternal security, you call it whatever you want, okay? I'm using Calvinism because most people can think and understand the basic tenets of Calvinism. And if you say that you are or are not, and you don't know the basic tenets of it, you probably should go and read up on it. For those who would be listening to this, who are at least of a Calvinist bent, I'm speaking to you. It makes me wonder how so many could affirm uh, that they are Calvinist. And uh, one of the main core tenets of Calvinism is that God has the freedom to choose anyone he wants for salvation. They hold to that very strongly. He may choose anyone he wants. And if they are somebody who um, is saved and professes faith in, in our Lord, Yahshua, Jesus, um, they'll also affirm that it is not because uh, they are good or they have made uh, the right choices. It is because God is good. He chose them. And it's part of, you know, uh, Calvin's um, adherence to that uh, theological system that he just sort of boiled down. I don't think he made it up. He found it in the Bible, just kind of boiled it down. His followers some years later, after the Armenians, uh, those uh, students of uh, Jacob Arminius, had uh, kind of inserted into the uh, maelstrom of uh, theological waves that were splashing all over the place during uh, all of the years of what's known as the Reformation, they inserted this idea that... Um, you know, God doesn't do that. That, uh, at most, he looks down the corridors of history and sees who will have faith and uh, put their faith in his, his only begotten son. Uh, and before that, have faith in his redemption to come and all that. And then that's how the election works, which I think is a fantasy that you have to make up uh, and you can't use scripture to uh, get to. Or it's a misuse of some random uh, portions of scripture. But now how is it that those people who do affirm Calvinism as being very biblical would be so put off at the idea that he has chosen a people <clears throat> excuse me, 
over and above other people. It seems like as soon as you say, you know, there's a lot of language in the scriptures that would uh, lead me to believe that concerning the election. And as soon as you say that, and as soon as you say, well, you know, I've been looking at this over uh, the course of history and everything, and um, I'm seeing a people, a certain people, uh, that the message of the good news, of the redemption uh, that, that Christ has afforded us, uh, that good news has um, always found very fertile ground in a certain specific race of people over and above anyone else who any other kind of people who you could name um, it has always found good fertile soil in a certain people a certain racial people as soon as you say that then they've got to throw Calvinism out the window say whoa 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 wait whoa wait a second you know, I've seen the tracts from the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society. And they all say that, you know, it's going to be a very, very mixed multi multiracial kingdom. <sighs> and, you know, in one aspect, I have to say that I haven't made up my mind about that. You know, as far as what is the role of other races in the kingdom to come? I don't know, but I'm not going to assume either. But you can't deny that if you at least go and read the Old Testament and just try to not let all of the evangelical preaching about what they believe the New Testament says influence you, but just read the Old Testament. Of course, you would have to affirm that Yahweh made his covenants with certain men and their specific ancestors. And I'm not yet saying that those are the only people who will have those, you know, amongst whom are saved, you know. I'm not yet saying that because there are too many incidents of other things going on in the Old Testament that I haven't worked out yet. But I do find it kind of ridiculous that you can say that to a Calvinist about individuals and they're fine with that but if you say that to a Calvinist about an entire race they're not fine with it that's very interesting and of course you can debate who and, and all that that's fine but I'm just saying if we're talking about a uh, If we're, if we're, look, if we're just talking about this, say, in a, a, a vacuum, okay, and we don't have to apply it to the real world just yet, I think it's hypocritical if you affirm that God can pick any individual he wants based on no merits or, or anything else and make them and do whatever he wants and give them whatever place he wants in his kingdom and in eternity but then to turn around and say but that's not a specific race of people oh it just can't be oh it just can't be oh he couldn't do that he wouldn't do that because as soon as you say that you have turned off your mind to the possibility of finding out something that could be quite true and that you did not know Again, I'm going to repeat it. 
I'm not saying I am yet specifically of that mind. I'm just saying that it's a hypocrisy. So back to they were white and they were slaves with the chapter Torture and Murder of White Slaves. White slaves were punished with merciless whippings and beatings. The records of Middlesex County, Virginia, relate how a slave master confessed that he had most uncivilly and inhumanely beaten a white female with a great knotted whipcord so that the poor servant is a lamentable spectacle to behold. Whippings were commonplace, as were iron collars and chains, from Eckridge, page 150. A case in the county from 1655 relates how a white slave was, quote, fastened by a lock with a chain to it, unquote, by his master, and tied up to a shop door, and, quote, whipped till he was very bloody, unquote. The beating and whipping of white slaves resulted in so many being beaten to death that in 1662 the Virginia Assembly passed a law prohibiting the private burial of white slaves because such burial helped to conceal their murders and encouraged further atrocities against other white slaves. A grievously ill white slave was forced by his master to dig his own grave, since there was little likelihood that the master would obtain any more labor from him. The white slave's owner, quote, made him sick and languishing as he was, dig his own grave, in which he was laid a few days afterwards. The others being too busy to dig it, having their hands full in attending to the tobacco. From Jasper Dankertz and Peter Schluter, Journal of a Voyage to New York and a Tour of Several American Colonies, 1679-1680, through 1680. in New England, Nicholas Weekes and his wife deliberately cut off the toes of their white slave who subsequently died. Marmaduke Pierce in Massachusetts severely beat a white slave boy with a rod and finally beat him to death. Pierce was not punished for the murder. In 1655 in the Plymouth Colony a master named Mr. Latham starved his 14-year-old white slave boy beat him and left him to die outdoors in sub-zero temperatures. The dead boy's body showed the markings of repeated beatings, and in his hands and his feet were frozen solid. Colonial records are full of the deaths by beating, starvation, and exposure of white slaves. In addition to tragic accounts such as the one of the New Jersey white slave boy who drowned himself rather than continue to face the unmerciful beatings of his master. From the American Weekly, Mercury, September 2nd <coughs> through 9th, 1731. <coughs> and as an aside, I gotta say, you know, um, people have a natural, tend to have a, a very strong natural survival instinct. Whereas, you know, so many people who have tried to kill themselves with certain methods that actually require you, um, forcibly um, applying whatever it is to yourself until you are dead. Let's say like uh, self-strangulation or um, self-drowning. Uh, some people that have tried that have uh, um, spoken to uh, the fact of how difficult it is because we do have a natural survival instinct. And then, so thus, I would have to say that this boy's trauma was so great, so fierce, so horrible, that he managed to overcome those natural survival instincts and keep himself gulping down water till it finally went into his lungs and he went to sleep and died. That is amazing. Okay, Henry Smith beat to death an elderly white slave and raped two of his female white slaves in Virginia. John Dandy beat to death his white slave boy whose back and blue body was found floating down a creek in Maryland. 
Pope Alvey beat his white slave girl Alice Sanford to death in 1663. She was reported to have been beaten to a jelly. Joseph Fincher beat his white slave Jeffrey Hageman to death in 1664. John Grammer ordered his plantation overseer to beat his white slave 100 times with a cat of nine tails. The white slave died of his wounds. <laughs> Naturally. The overseer, rather than expressing regret at the death he inflicted, stated, I could have given him ten times more. Now, there are thousands of cases in the colonial archives of inhuman mistreatment, cruelty, beatings, and the entire litany of Uncle Tom's cabin horrors administered to hapless white slaves. In Australia, white slave Joseph Mansbury had been whipped repeatedly to such an extent that his back appeared quite bare of flesh, and his collar bones were exposed, looking very much like two ivory polished horns. It was with difficulty that we could find another place to flog him. From uh, Tony uh, Chandler, the overseer, suggested to me that we had better do it on the soles of his feet next time. From Robert Hughes, The Fatal Shore, page 115, Hughes describes the fate of white slaves as one of prolonged and hideous torture. One overseer in Australia whose specialty was whipping white slaves would say, while applying his whip on their backs, another half pound mate off the beggar's ribs. The overseer's face and clothes were described as having the appearance of a mincemeat chopper being covered in flesh from the victim's body. Hughes, page 115. In colonial America, in the case, the sole punishment for the murder of a white slave, explained as an accident, consisted of the master of his wife being forbidden from owning any white slaves for a period of three years. Uh, a white girl enslaved by a woman called Mistress Ward was whipped so badly that she died from it. On the finding of a jury that such action was, quote, unreasonable and unchristian-like, Mistress Ward was fined 300 pounds of tobacco. Yes, because of course 300 pounds of tobacco is well worth the life of a white woman. It was no easy task to secure the conviction of a master for the murder of his white servant. Convictions of masters for the murder or manslaughter of their servants were definitely the exception. In a preponderance of such trials, they were acquitted or let off lightly, often in the face of incontrovertible evidence of guilt. From Morris, page 485 and 47. In 1678, Charles Grimlin, a wealthy American colonial planter, was found guilty of murdering a female white slave he owned. He was pardoned and set free. In the same year, a white woman, quote, of low origins, killed her husband, a man of some wealth. The same judge who had pardoned Grimlin sentenced the white woman, who was probably a descendant of white slaves, to be burned alive according to the law. Nor should it be concluded that because some trials were held for those masters who murdered their white slaves, that this reflected a higher justice than that given to black slaves. In thousands of cases of homicide against poor whites, there were no trials whatsoever. Murdered white slaves were hurriedly buried by their masters so that the resulting decomposition would prohibit any inquiry into the cause of their deaths. Others just disappeared, or died from accidents, or committed suicide, in quotes. Many of the high number of so-called suicides of white slaves took place under suspicious circumstances, but in every single case the slave master was found innocent of any crime for acquittals of masters in Virginia or instances of failure to prosecute them for the murder of white slaves, see Virginia General Court Minutes, 
VMH XIX 388. At the same time, white slaves, white servants, and poor white working men were forbidden to serve on a jury. Only whites who owned property could do so. Judges were recruited solely from the propertied class. Guess some things never change. When the few cases regarding the torture and murder of white slaves reached a court, it was not difficult to predict the outcome. A white orphan boy was kidnapped in Virginia and enslaved under the guise of teaching him a trade. The boy was able to have the Rappahannock County Court take notice of his slavery. An orphan complained on July 2, 1685, that he was held as a in a severe and hard servitude illegally, and that he was taken by one Major Hawkins under pretense of giving him learning. The case came before the court on August 2, but the justices decided that he must continue in the service of his present master. From Jernigan, pages 159 and 160. They possessed one right to complain to the planter magistrates concerning excessively violent abuse. But this right, which by custom was also available to black slaves in some societies, had little or no mitigating effect on the overall nature of their treatment on the estates. From Beckles, White Servitude, page 5. For information on blacks allowed to accuse white slave masters in court and who were freed from slavery as a result of hearings before white judges, see the minutes of Council of March 10, 1654 in the Lucas Manuscripts, Real 1, F92, Bridgetown Public Library, Barbados. In some cases, white slaves were whipped by the authorities just for making a complaint to a court about their master. In Westmoreland County, Virginia, in 1724, a white slave received 20 lashes for having complained of mistreatment. In 1738, another Westmoreland white slave, George Smith, was whipped 29 times for making a complaint. Constables and local magistrates in Virginia to whom mistreated white slaves might appeal were often these same men who enslaved and assaulted them. It should be recalled that the killing and maiming of white slaves was visited upon them by kinsmen of the same race and religion as their slaves, making the callous disregard for their human rights Doubly, or doubly heinous. And yeah, <clears throat> I got <laughs> I got a comment on that too. These these whites, these aristocratic planter whites in uh, the colonial times, we would have to assume based on their actions towards their fellow countrymen who were said to be of the same religion as they you'll remember that it, it just became a synonym to call a white person Christian because where all of them came from Europe that's what the religions of all the countries who were part of the Holy Roman Empire were known to be. Now we also have to conclude that the Holy Roman Empire and its religion spearheaded by Roman Catholicism was not the keeping of the tenets of the Bible. It was not. Sure, they may well have affirmed Jesus of Nazareth as being the son of the living God. But these people, the Roman Catholic Church and, and Roman Catholicism, you know, uh, they also confirmed by the ecumenical councils that Jesus was a co-equal, co-eternal with the Father, as was the Holy Spirit, an individual, separate, co-equal, co-eternal person. And when you 
uh, kind of smashed the three together, you got one God. They also affirmed that when a priest blessed the wine and unleavened bread, that it became, upon consumption, the real, literal, actual body and blood of Jesus of Nazareth. Um, their tenets, their traditions, just as the tenets and traditions of the Jews made the law of God of no effect. So these men uh, who are either um, shanghaiing, uh, stealing people from white countries, um, shipping them over to the colonies, and owning them and severely beating and murdering them, if they happen to be from the same countries and same race, the only thing that I could conclude from that information is that these men who were uh, part of any portion of this brutal enslavement and treatment of these people were either Talmudic Jews, were either um, Roman Catholic simply by title because even the Roman Catholic Church had in its canon laws typically um, at least they provided in their canon laws frequently lip service to treating others far better than the treatment that we see and I'm not saying everybody adhered to it. Now, you also have to keep in mind that <clears throat> around the time of the Reformation, the 1500s, uh, based on a Gregorian calendar, so about the 1500s, not only were um, people uh, in various countries of Europe uh, starting to just stand up uh, against Rome and the papacy and say no more you know we're going by the Bible we're teaching men the Bible we're going to translate the Bible into our languages the common man's language we're gonna get it to everybody so not only does that movement start around then but this is a time that even a guy like Michael Hoffman who is to this day a Roman Catholic. He will not leave the Roman Catholic Church, which I, I can't figure that out for the life of me, honestly. But, you know, even guys like him would admit to you that around this same time, the papacy was being, um, or let's just say by that time, the papacy had been pretty much fully uh, taken over and dominated by the uber wealthy clans of Europe. And I mean, who knows exactly what the history, what the background of these clans are. It seems to be a mystery even to this day. The specific racial, ethnic background of the families that head up those clans, you know? The clans like um, <clears throat> the Orsinis, the Breakspears, um, Medicis, uh, Farnese. There's about 10, 15 uber powerful families. And they were, by that time, running the papacy. The papacy was no more, if it ever had been, about the um, the maintaining um, of Christendom throughout what was once the pagan Roman Empire, now papal Roman Empire, to preserve that people um, united under one banner. If it had at any time um, been led by good people 
or at least better people than, you know, the Orsinis, Breakspears, the Medicis, Farnises, and etc. It was definitely by that same time of the Reformation extremely altered and very much perverted. Which, of course, was, you know, one of the things that uh, led Martin Luther to, uh, to post his 95 Thesis, um, because he was so disgusted with this selling of indulgences and, uh, you know, Tietzel and all of his uh, happy crap, that he was pushing to raise money to build St. Peter's Basilica. Either which way, these men and women who owned white slaves, I have to just appraise them as being the lowest of lowlifes. And we can see that, you know, a lot of them were as uh, Hoffman documented. I mean, even Quakers thought it was just fine. Now, I'm not going to speak against indentured servitude. <clears throat> I don't really think there's anything wrong with indentured servitude as long as you're going to fulfill the indentured servant's uh, servitude as according to the law of Yahweh. You have to let them go on the seventh year. Now, I know that we, uh, you know, specifically in the colonies, we couldn't have done that uh, based on land that they held or their family held and, and debts that they had as per that, okay, but you can still apply the, the, the laws of Yahweh to um, making a slave of your fellow countrymen and your fellow white man and letting them go on the seventh year. That isn't hard to understand. So it's just amazing the brutality that these people had against their own countrymen. And it makes me think that it would be very worthwhile for somebody to do some far deeper research on who these people were, this planter class, this aristocratic class that was owning and uh, murdering all these white slaves in the colonies. Um, because, you know, thus far, when somebody decided to start looking into who owned most of the slaving ships, you know, who was doing most of the business and bringing them overseas, they found out that, overwhelmingly, it was Jewish merchants. So I think that it would be uh, very profitable to find out uh, who was involved on, you know, the other two ends, the capturing of the white slaves and the owning of the white slaves as planters in the colonies. Okay, so enough of my lip. Back to the book at the chapter Crackers, Red Legs, Red Necks, and Hillbillies. The whole apparatus of the institution of human slavery in English speaking America, which has been searingly memorialized in the voluminous literature on Negro slavery was first put into place in the enslavement of whites who were kidnapped in their native land, died on board ship, suffered child slavery and separation from parents, from children forever, endured fugitive slave laws, the banning of white slave meetings, and severe and extreme corporal punishment, sometimes unto death. The motivation for the cover-up of the extent of white slavery by establishment-funded and approved house scholars is obvious. To admit the true, true history of white slavery and record it faithfully in modern history is to furnish empirical evidence that white skin does not necessarily embody power or status, that the poor white redneck of today who is asked to subsidize with his taxes and make sacrifices in his living wage and job prospects so that blacks may be compensated for slavery, in reality owes nobody for anything. 
I'm going to repeat that. The common white person today owes nobody for anything. A 1679 colonial census of whites who fled save slavery to scratch out an existence as subsistence and tenant farmers shows that they had to flee the worst land where they existed in extreme poverty, forming yeoman peasant communities in the hills. It is instructive to note that this white yeomanry was mocked and scorned by both the wealthy white planter elite as well as the Negroes. Rich white plantation owners joined with the Negroes in insulting white slaves and poor white people, referring to them as, quote, poor white earth scratching scum, unquote, or crackers, red shanks, red legs, forerunner of the redneck racial insult, current nowadays, hillbillies, and Scotland Johnnies. The servants were regarded by the planters as white trash. From Eric Williams, Capitalism and Slavery, page 17. White slaves were taunted in the West Indies by blacks who would chant the ditty, yellow hair, speckly face, and a feet brick red at them. From the epithet Red Shanks developed into the name Red Legs, which has since become a term for all survivors and descendants of white slaves in the Caribbean region. <clears throat> Various merchants and aristocrats of the 18th and 19th centuries despised the independence of these survivors of white slavery when they encountered them in the British West Indies. The chief hallmark of the Red Legs has been their absolute refusal to interbreed with the Negroes and their independent subsistence lifestyle of fishing and gardening. Here is a typical 19th century description of them by an aristocrat. That lowest of all beings, the Red Shanks, the latter were miserable and degraded white men who, priding themselves on their Caucasian origin, looked with contempt upon the African race. From Shepherd, page 3. A loyalist refugee from Georgia wrote in 1783, The southern colonies are overrun with a swarm of men from the western parts of Virginia and North Carolina distinguished by the name of crackers. Many of these people are descended from convicts that were transported from Great Britain to Virginia at different times, and inherit so much profligacy from their ancestors that they are the most abandoned set of men on earth, few of them having the least sense of religion. During the king's government, these crackers were very troublesome in the settlements. They also occasioned frequent disputes with the Indians. From Anthony Stokes, a view of the Constitution of the British Colonies, quoted in Eckrich, page 193. In 1654, Henry Whistler called the white slaves of Barbados rubbish, rogues, and whores. From Journal of the West India Exposition. In England, they had been referred to by Edmund Burke as a swinish multitude, by Samuel Johnson as rabble, and by Sir Josiah Child as loose, vagrant, vicious people. While the public articulation of such negative epithets against black people as nigger is regarded as a sacrilegious incitement to hate crimes. Hateful terms of abuse of white people, such as redneck and cracker, 
are gleefully recited in newspapers and television today and express the contempt which a powerful segment of our society continues to feel toward white, working, and poor people. It is a travesty of historiography that out of deference to the vast political house of cards that has been built upon the myth that only blacks were merchandised in the Atlantic slave trade, historians have failed to consistently describe white chattel by the scientifically accurate term for their condition, that of slave. By avoiding this description, many academics have perpetuated the propaganda of the plutocracy which inflicted these horrors upon white humanity. Powerful colonial land companies motivated by gigantic profits were loath to admit truths subversive of the fictions which permitted the smooth functioning of business as usual. The label given the white laborer in bondage was crucial to a correct understanding of his condition. In the founding era of colonial America, both white and black slaves were referred to as servants. Once the term slavery came into universal usage, a word derived from the enslavement of Slavic peoples, Object objective observers of the time who were without mercenary ties to the traffic in white servants called them slaves. Contemporary observers described it as white slavery and referred to indentured servants as white slaves. From Beckles, page 71. Some who in England lived fine and brave, was there like horses forced to trudge and slave. Some viewed our limbs turned us around, examining like horses we were sound. Some felt our hands, others leg our legs and feet, and made us walk to see we were complete. Some viewed our teeth to see if they was good, and fit to chaw our hard and homely food. No shoes nor stocking had I for wear, nor hat nor cap my hands and feet went bare. Thus dressed unto the fields I did go, among tobacco plants all day to hoe, till twelve or one o'clock a grinding corn, and must be up at daybreak in the morn. For I was forced to work while I could stand, or hold the hoe within my feeble hands. Forced from friends and country to go, void of all relief, sold for a slave. From the writing of White Slave, John Lawson, 1754, quoted in van der Zee, bound over. Honored Father, O oh dear Father, I am sure you'll pity your distressed daughter. What we unfortunate English people suffer here is beyond the probability of you in England to conceive. Let it suffice that I am one of the unhappy number toiling day and night, and very often in the horse's drudgery with only the comfort of hearing me called, You, bitch, you did not do half enough. Then I'm tied up and whipped to a degree that you'd not serve an animal. I have scarce anything but Indian corn and salt to eat, and that even begrudged. Nay, many Negroes are better used. After slaving, after master's pleasure, what rest we can get is to wrap ourselves up in a blanket and lay upon the ground. This is the deplorable condition your poor Betty endures. From a letter by white slave Elizabeth Spriggs in Maryland to her father John Spriggs in London, England, September 22, 1756. 
from the Public Record Office, London, England, High Court Admiralty. <clears throat> okay. Now we have in bold letters, Kidnapper. Originally one who stole or decoyed children or apprentices from their parents or masters to send them to the colonies, called also spiriting, but now used for all recruiting crimps for the king's troops or those of the East India Company and agents for indenting servants for the plantations. In bold. Captain Francis Gross, Dictionary of the Vulgar Tongue, 1796. Again, in bold, kidnapper, a stealer of human beings, especially of children. Ori origin for exportation to the plantations of North America, 1666. Uh, and on Leathermore's advice, known also as the Nicker Nicked. In form, Kidnapper, 1676, Coles, 1698, B.E., 1707, J. Shirley, 1723, D. Defoe, Colonel Jacques, the term, S.K., 1750, S.E.C.A., 1830. It is to be noted that kidnappers worked in gangs, witnessed D. Defoe, Colonel Jacques. He was got among a gang of kidnappers, as they were then called, being a sort of wicked fellows, that us to spirit people's children away, that is to snatch them up in the dark, and stopping their mouths, carry them to such houses where they had rogues, ready to receive them, and so carry them on board ships bound to Virginia, and sell them, let a child stealer, a child stealer, a stealer of children, see kid and napper. In bold, Eric Partridge, a dictionary of the underworld. Now on screen, if you will take out your smartphone or if in any other way you're listening, you can take a look. And I'm going to leave this <clears throat> up on screen for just a minute so you can uh, get a look at it. This is a gang of men and women transports being marched from Newgate to Blackfriars, chained neck to neck and hand to hand. These wretches were led through the streets of Blackfriars Stairs, where they were taken aboard a barge and carried down the river to the vessel which was to transport them to America. And why isn't this picture in the history books when we talk about slavery? Because it would ruin the plans of those people who have been for some time now and are continuing in a more desperate effort to end us common white people. And why do you think that is of all the races and peoples of the world? They are trying so desperately to end us white Anglo-Saxon Germanic kindred peoples. Why of all people? Why? Those of you who think that there's some sort of absurdity or ridiculousness to tracking the obvious history of the Israelite people up through the Black and Caspian Seas or through their boats in the Mediterranean up into all parts of Europe and the British Isles in wave upon wave upon wave of migrations from the time of the Exodus up until long after the time of the Assyrian dispersion. Did they migrate and did they come to Europe? It is that very people who are the Israel of today. When you read those prophecies, if you are enticed to, de to believe that the blacks are Israel today because of the language used concerning enslavement of Israel. Consider this book for one thing. Why are they trying to destroy us as a race and a people? 
you better ask yourself that until you come up with the answer because that's exactly what's going on. And if you don't believe that's what's going on, it's because you're willfully blind. <clears throat> so we've got some portraits here. And I'm not sure exactly who these people are other than to assume that these were portraits of men who were, at one time, white slaves. I'm going to scroll through them somewhat slowly so that if you're listening, you can go back and you can look at the screen, see what I'm showing. Now I'll try to do this very slowly because I'm seeing based on my mouse um, guide at the right hand of the screen that there seems to be a lot more left in this PDF. Yeah, at the bottom of the page. It's, these pictures are survivors of white slavery. See these men? Common European men. Look like me, look like you. Don't look like a Jew. Doesn't look like a black. Looks like a common white Anglo-Saxon Germanic kindred person. We have another woodcut here. Uh, right before the next chapter entitled The Death of Two Human Brooms. And I imagine maybe it's not a chapter, perhaps it's just a description. I'm going to leave this picture up just for a moment so you can see what all is going on here in this woodcut before I begin to read. That chapter on human brooms from earlier was one of the hardest chapters for me to read. What they did to children. Uh, I imagine for all of you who listened to it, it was one of the hardest to listen to, actually. Um, so yeah, this this is just a description of uh, this picture I just had up. Uh, the death of two human brooms, in quotes. All right, the description of that woodcut. Poor white children were a very expendable commodity in Georgian and Victorian England, as this period print of an actual chimney sweeping accident illustrates. Enslaved to a master of chimney sweeps from as young as the age of four, white boys were enforced to, were forced to climb inside suffocating and cramped flues and clean them. They received no pay, begged their food, and slept in cellars. Many died from accidents, beatings, and cancer, brought on from constant contact with ash and cinder, which they had no opportunity to wash from their skin. The illustration above, two climbing boys, in quotes, have been crushed and suffocated after the collapse of the chimney's masonry. The man on the right with the pick is a builder who has been summoned to extricate the children. One lies dead on the floor at the bottom left, mourned perhaps by a servant of the house since these white slaves were almost all orphans or the kidnapped children of paupers. The other boy remains stuck in the flue. His master is attempting to pull him from the rubble by his foot and leg as the lady of the house looks on. Thousands of white children slaved as sweeps. The British House of Lords repeatedly refused to outlaw the use of white children under the age of ten or reform the trade in any way. The Lords contended that to do so would interfere with property rights in quotes and I'm going to go back up to this woodcut so here you have look at this I'm moving my cursor over this that right there that's the body of one of these little white slaves all right this is a, a, a servant woman of course mourning and weeping over her fellow slave Perhaps she, at one point in time, had one of her children stolen from her. You have 
this builder that has been called in to figure out how to extricate the body of this child whose pig of a master is pulling on his poor little corpse. I would imagine outside the door is the mistress of the house who's probably only thinking about what kind of damage has been done to her home and how long it'll be before she can have her beautiful parlor back. This makes me want to puke. This photo, this woodcut, and the description makes me want to puke. And here's the thing. This kind of assault towards our children hasn't ended. It's why in videos of the past, when I was talking about the, the recent stories of that pig of a man, um, that top of the pops pig, um, of course now his name escapes me, Jimmy Savile, Jimmy Savile pig and his involvement with the pigs in crowns and what these pigs still do to hunt down like the pigs they are our children sometime if you haven't <clears throat> just eaten and you can stand it you need to listen to the documentary boys for sale and get it in your head what they're still doing to white children the world over now why do I keep saying white children isn't it all children aren't they aren't they out there after all children well yes in many circumstances they do defile and capture and hurt and murder in in satanic rituals and eat and drink the blood of and sodomize all kinds of children but as you will see from uh, things like boys for sale or as you would read if you would read uh, say for instance uh, John DeCamp's damage control book the Franklin cover-up the most prized possession of these pigs who masquerade as men and women the most prized possession of these pigs is white children blonde haired blue eyed if they can if not they'll take dark haired brown eyed white children that's what these pigs want so don't you ever ever feel like you're being overprotective with your children don't you ever you be overprotective because it is being protective you be overprotective of your children your neighbors children your friends children all children because those pigs are out there those pigs are out there and they're looking to either make money or in other cases fulfill their disgusting satanic vile pleasures in them and it does not matter to me what you have to do to protect your children and our children not a bit you do what you have to do you do what you have to do but watch over them protect them pray for them because our Heavenly Father can keep better watch over them than we can 
and our Redeemer, Yahshua, loves children. Woe ho ho to him, woe to you pigs that harm these little children. It would be better for someone to tie a millstone to your neck and throw you in the sea, in the deepest part of the sea, than what it's going to be like after you awaken from your sleep of death to find that you now stand before the Holy One of Israel and he has judgment for you. It would be better if you're a harmer, a capturer, a toucher, a defiler of children, do yourself a favor. Tie the millstone around your own neck and cast it into the sea. If you're not going to turn from what you're doing right now, do yourself a favor. And end your life before you have to stand before the Holy One of Israel and account for what you've done to the children he loves. So I hope that message will find fertile ground. Now the next photo, and this is a photo, it's not a woodcut. I'm going to leave the photo up on the screen. It's three young children, white children, girls. A childhood in the factory. The British and American factory system of the Industrial Revolution was staffed mainly by enslaved or indentured white children who were forced to work as children had never worked before. 16 hours a day locked into a building without breaks except to go to the necessary. Food was taken standing up while tending the primitive machinery which mutilated tens of thousands of children. For falling asleep or talking, white girls and boys were beaten with a leather strap or a billy roller, a murderous iron bar. The photograph above is of American girls who worked a 70 70 hour week in a factory in South Carolina in the early 1900s. The early 1900s. For all of you belly aching, spoiled, non working, so called minorities, this is what the whites have endured. Next, another photograph of an elderly man in a field, which appears to be a cotton field, with a large bag thrown over his shoulder. This is entitled Alabama Sharecropper, 1936. The Hard scrabble life of a rural white American, many of them descendants of white slaves, has been made a subject of comedy, scorn, dismissal, and denial. They are called rednecks, crackers, and white trash. Their history 
has been suppressed, their heritage and way of life condemned. The sharecropper pictured above was not allowed to grow so much as a patch of vegetable garden for his family's needs. On the land he worked for the Margraves brothers, lest it take away even a few hundred square feet from the cotton he cultivated and picked on their behalf. And now, the end notes. 1. The Oxford English Dictionary traces the word slave, also skelu, sklav, or sklaif, to the medieval Latin sklavas, which was the name for the Slavs. The German philologists Grimm trace this word for the Slavic peoples and chattel enslavement to the late Greek, medieval Latin, and German sources in their Deutsches Wörterbuch under the heading Sklav. In early Britain, another white nationality bore the same eponymous stigma. The West Saxon word for slave was Wylisk, from the Old English Huel, which was also the name for the Celtic or Welsh race, but by the ninth century had the distinct meaning in Britain of slave. Other words for white slave which demonstrate the ubiquity of white enslavement include Esne or Pio, which is Old English. Thrall is an anglicized word taken from Scandinavian sources. In Middle English, thrall, and in Old English, prael, from the Old Norse prael. Drigil, Old High German, probably derived from the Proto Old Norse prahilar, and the Proto Germanic praghila from the Gothic Pragjan, Ambut, Old Swedish, Ambacus, Celt, Anopogeher, Old Danish, Anoiger, Old Icelandic, Mansalsmeor, Old Norse, literally, Man, Sailman, Lassir, or Esir, and rab are the Russian words for slave. The English word robot is derived from the Russian word for work, robota, the labor of a slave, from Heli, page 711, which says much about the legacy of white slavery in Russia. The Muslims called white slaves by the Arabic version of the word Slav. Sakaliba. 2. One remarkable former member of the poor white trash of the South who exhibited a lifelong solidarity with his own kind was the phenomenally success. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm reading so many odd words. I have to uh I have to pronounce them by syllable. <laughs> so, okay, he was the phenomenally successful Andrew Johnson, military governor of Tennessee, US senator, vice president, and 17th president of the United States. A prevailing myth has it that Lincoln was assassinated because hidden powers knew he would be lenient to the South during Reconstruction. This view is exploded when one studies the background and views of his successor to the presidency, who was everything to the defeated Southern people, though not to their planter-dominated Confederate leadership, who he generally despised. That the myth-makers claim Lincoln would have been. <clears throat> President Johnson was impeached 
mainly through the partisan efforts of politicians such as Republican Thaddeus Stevens and a representative, sorry, Thaddeus Stevens and Senator Charles Sumner, precisely because Johnson refused to cooperate in the collective reconstruction punishment of poor white people in the South. And sometime I really need to read on the reconstruction and what a brutal savage crime it was to the whites of the South. Andrew Johnson was born in Raleigh, North Carolina, where at the age of 10 he was apprenticed to the Selby Tailor Shop and ordered to work 12 hours a day until he was 21 years of age. Andrew could hardly miss feeling the striking contrast between himself and the white elite. The aristocrat's contempt was scarcely hidden. When Andrew and his cousins once ran across the path between the house of John Devereux and that of his son, Devereux sent his coachman to whip the boys back to their shanty. The whip was habitually used on the those the Devereux called poor white trash from Hans L. Trefus, Andrew Johnson, a biography, page 21. After enduring nearly six years of apprenticeship, Johnson fled Raleigh. A $10 reward was posted for his capture. By law, no other employer in North Carolina was allowed to give him work. As long as he remained in North Carolina, he was subject to arrest and in danger of capture. Johnson fled to Tennessee, where he went into business for himself and eventually became a leader of men. Johnson has been described as having, quote, strongly held predilections for the white laboring classes and deepest prejudice against the blacks, from Trefus, page 223. As military governor of Tennessee during the war, Johnson protected the white poor from Trefus, pages 164 through 165. Well, gosh, I suppose somebody had to, right? Johnson was a staunch unionist, strictly devoted to preserving the country as one nation. Lincoln selected him as vice president in 1864 because Johnson was a border state southerner and constant constituency which was Lincoln's crucial power base and one he sought to fortify with Johnson, never expecting the latter would ever be anything more than a figurehead. That Lincoln and Johnson held very different views on racial matters was evident when Lincoln introduced Johnson to a black leader at the inauguration. Frederick Douglass recalled that when Lincoln pointed him out to Johnson prior to the ceremonies, the vice president responded at first with a bitter expression of contempt. Douglas concluded right then and there that the Tennessean was no friend of the black race, from Trefus, page 190. Perhaps Johnson had read Douglas's book, Life and Times, which denounced the poor white people of Maryland as being, quote, of the lowest order. From Douglas, page 27. As president, Johnson ordered the removal of Negro troops from East Tennessee and Mississippi. He also reanimated white Southern resistance and fatally undermined efforts to integrate the Negro freedmen into society. According to the Cincinnati Enquirer, Johnson wrote to Governor Thomas C. Fletcher of Missouri, This is a country for white men, and by God, as long as I am president, it shall be a government for white men. In 1859, while U.S. Senator Johnson asserted that the famous phrase in the Declaration of Independence proclaiming that all men were created equal could not apply to Negroes. The 17th president unquestionably undermined the Reconstruction process. What defeated him during his term in the White House was not so much his lack of formal education, nor even his tactlessness, but his failure to outgrow his Jefferson-Jacksonian background. Johnson's continued 
I, I'm sorry, I indentification with an American of small farmers and mechanics, his attachment to a strict construction of the Constitution that was no longer in vogue, his refusal to adjust his racial views to the needs of the Republican Party, and his persistent belief in the agrarian myth blinded him to the realities of the post-Civil War U.S. Well, before I continue reading, I would have to comment that uh, most people, of course, will look at this on its surface and consider Johnson to be such a, what a hateful man, what a bigot. I think that Johnson, going through what he did in his childhood and young adulthood, understood that the poor white class of this country, who were more enslaved, more brutalized, and more murdered than any black, and seeing the fact that Negro slaves were often readily employed and very willing to kill and subdue and put down the rebellions of these poor white slaves, he knew somebody had to be a voice of protection for these people. And when you consider, furthermore, the atrocities against the common white class in the South during this Reconstruction, which was one of the greatest crimes uh, in the United States against its own people, at least at that period of time, if you start understanding what kinds of criminal activities were given carte blanche against the common white class of the South, you'll understand what a disgusting crime Reconstruction was. So the thing is, I think it would be remiss for anyone to chalk Johnson up as just some kind of uh, ignorant bigot. Johnson May be It may be that Johnson's greatest weakness was the fact that he did not understand the deep, deep complexities of the ruling class, their power, their money, and what they wanted accomplished with the Civil War and Reconstruction. <sighs> Onward. Considering the effect of his policies upon the South, he had achieved, at least in the long run, what he wanted. The continued existence of viable Southern state governments within the Union and the maintenance of white supremacy. From Trefus, page 225, 233, 236, 119, 378, 379, 352. Obviously, this Trefus was not a fan of Johnson. You can tell just by the dialogue. Um, I'm sorry, vocabulary he uses, the connotations he uses towards Johnson. That Trefus was not a fan of Johnson, it would seem. President Johnson vetoed the Civil Rights Bill of 1866 to protest the Convention of Colored Men met in Washington and chose a delegation to take their grievances directly to the president. Both Frederick Douglass and his son Lewis were members of the delegation. Douglass, as chief spokesman, said that black people should be given the vote with which to save ourselves. So, from the earliest times, uh, Frederick Douglass is seen as a great hero, wanting to save, preserve, and empower his race. But when a president such as Johnson comes up and has power to do the same for his, which were treated worse than Douglass's, all of a sudden, he's the bad guy. That is absolute hypocrisy and ignorance of history. Johnson once, an indentured servant learning the craft of tailoring with repressed anger, declared, moving very near to Mr. Douglas, that poor whites and blacks had always been bitter enemies, and if they were thrown together at the ballot box, a race war would ensue. 
Johnson told delegating that he told the, the delegation he was addressing. That's what he, sorry, that's what he told the delegation he was addressing from William S. McFeely, Frederick Douglass, pages 247 and 248. Radical Republican Massachusetts Senator Charles Sumner also personally interceded with President Johnson to demand the vote for Negroes. After meeting with Johnson, Sumner wrote much that he said was painful from its prejudice and perversity. This is all very interesting, I must say, as a side note, uh, what was going on here politically and what has gone on since. And why I find it so interesting is because, of course, this aristocracy that used people like Frederick Douglass, who I don't believe was some great emancipator in any way, shape, or form, probably a very well-paid author, and who knows if he even wrote his own books, but that is a whole other issue. What I'm saying is, is that, of course, popular history would probably try to and has written men like Doug Douglas as great folk heroes and men like Johnson as great savages. When, when it comes right down to it, Johnson knew probably as well as anybody did who had a good bead on the way things were for his people, the poor white Anglo-Saxon and Germanic kindred people, that were they to give the vote to the Negro that these classes knew and still know how easily manipulatable, first off, that the Negroes were, and secondly, how willing they were to brutalize the poor white class. They were willing to do so and did so in colonial times, and of course, are still of that state of mind disprove me. Now, President Johnson was so contemptuous of the Negrophile senator that in the course of their discussion he used the senator's hat as a spittoon. <laughs> That's funny. He was determined to frustrate congr uh, congressional reconstruction and to protect southern whites from what he considered the horrors of full racial equality. The man who succeeded Lincoln, New York Times, July 29th, eight, or 1989. And having concluded point number two and President Johnson, I can't stress enough that my good listener look into all of the horrors committed against the common white class perpetrated uh, in large part by Negroes used by the white upper classes or whatever those pigs were, I don't know, used the Negroes against white common people in the Reconstruction. Now, point three. Negro involvement in the enslavement of their fellow blacks was extensive. In Africa, down to the 1930s, the various tribes continued to raid one another to capture slaves both for domestic use and to sell to outsiders. Moreover, in spite of the picture presented in Alex Haley's Roots, white slave traders almost never entered the interior in pursuit of prey, but rather purchased their cargo from Africans at the ocean front. Coastal Africans would not allow Europeans either into or through their own countries. Before the appearance of the Suzanne Myers and Igor Kapitov and Milesu volumes, Slavery in Africa, Anthropological and Historical Perspectives, some scholars claimed that slavery in Africa was a response to the international slave trade, but it is now obvious that black slavery was an old domestic institution that was adapted for supplying the international market when it developed. So it was going on for a long time before there was any market for it internationally. Let that be known. 
That's from Halley, page 22 and 24. Point four. Professor Handlin informs us that legislators in Virginia sought to cover up the record of white bondage and its equivalence to Negro servitude. Quote, the compiler of the Virginia laws codifying black slavery for the first time then takes the liberty of altering texts to bring earlier legislation into line with its own new notions. From Hanlon, page 216, four examples of alterations to insert the word slave as a reference to blacks in Virginia when it had not been used to describe them that way before. See Henning, volume 2, pages... Uh, 170, 283, and 490. What was it later lawmakers sought to cover up? The fact that the white ruling class of colonial America had cast their own white people into the same condition as the blacks, or even worse. Richard Legon's eyewitness report of a white slave revolt in Barbados in 1649 has been regularly referred to down through the years by at least a dozen later historians, including Poyer, Oldmixon, and Schomburg, as a rebellion of Negro slaves. In their cases, this does not seem to have been a matter of deliberate falsification, but rather a complete inability to conceive of whites as slaves. Ligon had written that the rebels in question had not been able to, quote, endure such slavery, quote, any longer, and the later historians automatically assumed that this had to have been a reference to Negroes. It is this persistent cognition by categorical preconception that renders much of what passes for colonial historiography in our era inaccurate and misleading. Point five. Old English law did have something of a white slave code based on the concept of villainage, from which we derive the words villain and villainy, with their now pejorative connotations. With the emergence of the English common law, 1175 through 1225, came the rise of the writ of novel decision, which dealt with who was qualified to contest land evictions. The aristocrats who drafted the writ established a category of juridical unfreedom known as villain tenure, which could defeat any English peasant's claim to land, no matter how long his family had held it. I gotta interject here. <clears throat> This may or may not be a more important, uh, important note to refer back to in the future. I don't know. But so many historians that look at the paths of the tribes of Israel from their expulsion of the land of Canaan uh, by Yahweh uh, in the 700s, I think it was, B.C., to different countries in Europe, the different peoples of Europe. So many of them have kept identifying again and again um, England as Ephraim. Now, Ephraim's standard was that of a bull. Dan, they, as it's clearly seen, were all over Europe for a heck of a long time. Even Deborah in the Book of Judges refers to Dan staying in their ships during times of battle. Dan, um, which is pointed out uh, by, by some relatively honest historians, uh, archaeologists, or journalists, like, for example, Simka Yakubovich, who uh, pointed out that uh, a culture of people called the Danoi were present in Greece um, 
many, many hundreds of years BC. And when I say many, I should say like 1.5 millennia BC. I mean a long, long time before uh, Israel's general expulsion uh, from the land of Canaan by Yahweh, using the Assyrians to do so. Now what I'm getting to is, with Dan being one of the earliest tribes to uh, be sailing all around and settling all kinds of areas of the Mediterranean and areas of Europe, when you consider the fact that in the book of Revelation, when the tribes of Israel are sealed, there are two tribes absent from this sealing. One is Dan, one is Ephraim. When I look at all of the crimes and oppression towards the Israelite people down through the years, there are two peoples that qualify as the most oppressing towards them other than Jews, but they wouldn't be counted in those 12 tribes because Jews don't have any relation to Judah, the tribe, nor Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The two tribes who are actual Israelite tribes that are left out of that listing are Dan, whose standard is the eagle, and Ephraim, whose standard is the bull. Rome's standard was the eagle. England's standard was the bull. It's just a side note. I'm not saying that that is going to lead to anything or not. It's just a thought. Continuing. At first, Villain denoted a white peasant from the French Carolingian word Villani. A general description for a peasant depended upon a lord. And the sense of evil that was attached to the word was largely a construct of the rich who would naturally want their world order to be seen as good and therefore any white kinsman enslaved was seen as justly deserving of such treatment and hence had to have been bad, evil, a villain. I'm going to make another side note. You know something? Israel, back through their history, which was why they were expelled in the first place, this is how they were treating each other then. And I am very, very excited about the end of this. When Israel is finally fully restored, when the Father's will is done, when the time of the nations is full, come into its fullness and complete, when there will be no more of these crimes, one man against another, and I don't just mean white men, I mean all men. No more crimes, one man against another. It was as important for the English nobility to make this claim about English slave villains as it was for American colonial merchants to labor, label the whites as enslaved as criminals and traitors, or the common parlance found in original documents of the period as rubbish and Dung. The Oxford Dictionary gives the following definition of villainy. Quote, the condition or state of a villain, bondage, servitude, hence base or ignoble condition. From the compact edition of the Oxford English Dictionary, pages 3, page 3631. That's a light read. In other words, the connection between villainy and evil first came about from a premeditated association between the condition of being a slave and the state of being an evil person. Who is it that would benefit from stigmatizing white slaves as evil beings? Who but the slave-holding aristocracy who could then justify any crime they committed against these villains? Much of the common understanding of the land swindles perpetuated against the English villain class is derived from the legal treatise De Legibus et Consuetudinis, 
Denebus Anglae, commonly known as Bracton after Sir Henry de Bracton. Funny, it's all in Latin. The Bracton Code equates the English villain with the Roman service or slave. The Bracton Code denies all rights to the villain by placing him in the same category as the Roman service. Villainage was considered a hereditary condition. Neither of Duke, Earl, or Lord by ancestry, but villain, villain, people. Bradshaw, St. Westburg, 1513. Thou art of villain blood on thy father's side. Caxton, 1483. This propaganda labeling of enslaved whites may be better understood if we examine the original meaning and the subsequent connotations associated with the use of another name, that of churl. We become someone, someone a churl today who is badly bred or ill-mannered. We call someone a churl. I guess. I don't. Yet, according to the Random House Dictionary of the English Language, originally a churl was an English free man of the lowest rank, the poorest white who was not a slave. It is no coincidence that the names for white slaves and white poor came to be linked with evil and bad breeding as part of a self-serving process of application manufactured by their rulers. A revealing display of the opprobrium associated with both words is exhibited in a description by Sir Walter Scott, sweeping from the earth some few hundreds of villain churls who are born but to plow it. Wow. Okay, so we get into, I'll go to point six. The association of these names with what Scott views as a degraded existence of plowing the earth is a holdover from plutocratic ancient Roman philosophy. Quote, Romans considered manual occupations as degrading in themselves, from William Phillips, page 28, since these were associated in the aristocratic mind uh, with the work of slaves, which is really funny because our God, Yahweh, considers that kind of work as very good, honest, decent, the kind of work that a man who is doing his will would do. Up until recently, European history was largely written from the point of view of institutional churchianity, the wealthy, the aristocracy, and the merchant class at the expense of the laboring people. Rodney Hilton further cautions that historians risk falling into a trap dug for the peasants by the lawyers. For most of our evidence about freedom and serfdom depends on evidence which is by product of the legal process. From Hilton, Freedom and Villainage in England, Past and Present, July 1965. Now, we all know which people have tended to excel in the profession of law. Lawyers. Pharisees. The creation of an exculpatory nomenclature rigged to justify the depredations of the ruling class against the white poor by establishing an intrinsic relationship between being poor and being evil is a masterstroke of propaganda. It leads to the internalization of these negative images in the minds of the white poor themselves. Some memory of these connections and connotations were no doubt extant in the minds of colonial Americans, and has surely contributed to the dearth of material on those who survived or were descended from white slavery. Indentured servitude gave ordinary whites of the American Revolution generation galling experience of a variety of social oppressions from Rodiger page 30 the widespread hatred of the appellation servant and the refusal to be called by most Americans however lowly their station has been noted by many observers and usually ascribed to the heady Republican sentiments of the newly independent nation as late as 1839, the English writer Francis Trollope remarked, It is more than petty treason to the Republic to call a free citizen a servant from domestic manners of the Americans. 
It has been noted that servant was the word for slave in early colonial America. The lawyer, John Bristed, observed that the perceived linkage between the status of slave and servant was widespread even among whites in 19th century America. Bristed commented on the tendency of U.S. citizens towards confounding the term servant with that of slave. There was good reason for such confounding. Dating from the early impression of colonial usages of slave and servant, right through Noah Webster's inconsistent distinctions between the two terms in his Dictionary of 1828, and that from Rodiger, page 47. Given the extent of white slavery in America, which had been largely disguised under the subterfuge of the phrase servant, it is not unreasonable to attribute white working class sensitivity associated with the use of this word to anger stemming from their memory of enslavement. In Britain and Europe, under the laws of villainage, survivors and descendants of white slavery were susceptible to discrimination before the law and even re-enslavement. The former white slaves, now serfs, might gradually shift into another legal category over several generations, or the taint of servility might lose much of its practical meaning as they become de facto independent. But the descendants of white slaves were for centuries considered unfree in a way that other people in equally dependent economic positions were not. From Karras, page 36. This stigma was based not only in law but in racial terms. The culture of the medieval slaveholders created an image of white slaves that set them apart, their whole moral character tainted by the fact of enslavement if not by slave ancestry. From Karras, pages 15 and 16. This taint, which the ruling class cleverly asserted was the result of some hereditary defect among white slaves, has been applied to many nations of white peoples from the slaves to to the Irish, Welsh, and Scottish. The defect attached to white slave blood by their rulers served as an effective device for one, keeping descendants of white slaves from seeking redress for past wrongs, two, being ashamed to identify their heritage and background in the form of written memorialization, and three, serving as a neat propaganda justification for the continuing privileges and governance of the aristocracy. This pattern is occasionally overturned when we examine unfiltered folk literature or music. For example, in such 13th century Icelandic folk sagas as the Frost Broera and the Lax Doella, white slaves are portrayed as fair and Nordic in general appearance and possessed of great personal courage and honor. I'm going to save point six to next time. I know I've already gone an hour 43. Going to be kind of a long video. But there was a lot of material to cover, and there, you know what? There was a lot of commentary that I had to stick in there, for better or for worse, like it or leave it. So, picking up with point six next time, I would imagine that we will be concluding Michael Hoffman II's They Were Whites and They Were Slaves. I do sincerely hope that this has absolutely empowered every white man, woman, child who listens to it, who gets this book and reads it, and I hope honestly that every other person of every other race that comes across this and either reads these pages or hears me read these pages will consider what exactly is going on when a certain class of people who hold a great deal of power are trying to use you and your people 
to kill off or breed out of existence my people. Because I love my people and I love my race and do not want to see it either killed off or bred out of existence. And I would say, no matter who you are or how ignorant you may currently be, I can promise you that you don't want to see that happen either. My plea to all those listening is that you, if you wish for the preservation of your race, culture, and heritage, that you turn from your ways and you turn back to Yahweh and pray for your people. Because this is not going to be won only by sheer might. Not that the whites don't have such sheer might. But I really don't know that our Father, Yahweh, is going to allow such a redemption of our people as a people according to the perceptions of gaining it through our own strength, but through Him, through turning to Him, trust in His Messiah, Yahshua, Jesus, whom He sent to redeem us. And He will preserve us as He's promised. Now, if you don't care much about the preservation of your people, shame on you. Till next time, I hope this will give you food for thought, and I hope you will do well.